The message today is called The Rock of My Strength. This slide up on your screen, if you're just listening, I'll describe it to you. It's a great rock. And this is a very famous photo that was taken by my grandfather many years ago, probably in the late 20s, almost a century now ago. And it shows the shepherd and his sheep under the shadow of this great stone. It was taken in Palestine, which is now Israel, of course. And um, I thought I would use that as the theme photo for this morning. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to read two different versions this morning. I'm going to start with the New American Standard, which we often use here. And this wonderful psalm, turn with me to Psalm 62. This is a psalm of David. Oh, how we love the Davidic Psalms. But it's a psalm of David, and I'd like to read it verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. Psalm 62, verse 5. My soul, wait in silence for God only. For my hope is in him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, and shall not be shaken. On God my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Remain standing. I'd like to read that same passage from another translation. This is one I don't think I've read from in this church. I've got 55 different translations and Bibles in my, well, I've got hundreds of Bibles, but 55 different translations in my library. But this is one I rarely use, but I actually like this one. It's from the New Jerusalem Bible. This particular scripture is very succinct and very, very good. So I'm going to read from Psalm 62 and the same verses we just finished hearing. Starting again with verse 5. It says, Rest in God alone, my soul! Exclamation mark. He is the source of my hope. He alone is my rock, my safety, my stronghold, so that I stand unwavering. In God is my safety and my glory, the rock of my strength. You may be seated. Such wonderful scriptures. Praise God for his word and may it be alive to our hearts this morning. There are five things that I'd like to talk about from this passage. Five things that God is to you and to me. Now, I'm only talking to believers. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood atonement, this has got nothing to do with you. But if you are, this has got everything to do with you. First of all, it says that God is my rock in verse 6. So our acceptance of The blood atonement of Christ is so integral to our walk with him. Repentance, how critical it is to have the blood between us and a holy God. To have an understanding of the horror of sin and to have some understanding of its consequences. So a holy God, 
There's a beautiful song my wife will often sing called Hide Me in Your Holiness. But the words of it are just wonderful about being hidden in God. Do you know, I'm going to read a passage for us from 1 Samuel. And you can turn with me as I'm speaking here. This is from 1 Samuel 17. But I want you to realize the magnitude of what is being said here. This is being talked out across the valley of Allah by a 17-year-old. A 17-year-old, his name was David ben Jesse. David ben, meaning son of Jesse. David ben Jesse. And this 17-year-old screamed out and yelled across the valley of Allah at a monster, a monster that you and I could hardly imagine how fearsome he was. But this is what David ben Jesse said in 1 Samuel 17, starting with verse 45. Again, a 17-year-old. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. Can you hear his voice going across the valley there? as thousands of Philistines are listening to this and thousands of Israelites are listening to this, and I will strike you down. This is before they ever went into battle. And I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. Then it happened, when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine, and David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead, and the stone sank deep into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Praise God for his word. The Lord is our rock. He is our stone. This stone that David found there in the brook and put it in his pouch and later took it out after he had spoken to the monster, this stone was so powerful that it drove the greatest warrior probably in the history of the world to his face. What power we have in the rock. In verse 7, it says, the rock of my strength. Listen, there's no strength. There's no staying power without the Lord, without him. The New Jerusalem Bible, we just finished reading from it, says, I stand unwavering. I stand unwavering. You may have heard this story before, perhaps you have not. It was about 11 o'clock at night. My wife and I were in a group getting ready to go down to the Western Wall in Jerusalem. There was about a dozen of us. The Israeli captain that was our guide led us down to the wall, and this was after the Hasidic Jews had retired for the night, and it was kind of quiet there. 
And he led us down to the wall and through a, an opening that they had just dug. They had just opened up this cavern, this small passageway. And we went down, down, down for about a quarter mile. You can't do this anymore. You're aware of this. You can't do this anymore. But for about a quarter mile, we went down underground, down, down, down. And all these old Herodian stones were down there under the dirt. We finally were 200 feet below the surface. It was filthy in the sense that all this sewage was dripping down, and they just opened this up for a couple of days. And we went down to the bottom, and all these stones that were 2,000 years old were down there. And as we went further and further on this passage that they had opened up, suddenly there were these massive stones. I'm talking 100-ton stones perfectly cut. There were four of them, perfectly cut. This is a true story. And I went and ran my hand. I still remember, I I was looking at my hand this morning when I was thinking about this story. Wow, my hand actually got to touch these things. But I was running my hand along these four massive stones. And the captain said, watch this. And he took out his pocket knife. And the stones were so perfectly cut. These are hundred ton stones. They were so perfectly cut that he could not get his knife between the stones. Four of them. Underneath the stones was this massive bedrock. The story goes on. We went a little further and there was this passageway. It had been cut back just a few feet back in. I turned to the guide and I said, what is this? And he said, we believe that behind that archway, behind all this dirt, we're going to find a retaining room. And we're believing we're going to find some very rare things back in that room. Of course, I'm thinking Titus and the burning of Jerusalem and the caving in of the whole city and the priests trying to save some of the articles. What's in that room? We left that night and made our way back out. The word got out that we'd been underneath the Muslim quarter because to go a quarter mile took you down to where the Muslim quarter was. Jerusalem, as you know, is divided into four quarters. The Armenian, the the Christian, the Jewish, and Muslim. Anyway, and they heard we were under there, and so riots started. They had all these demonstrations, and they had to bring out the shovels and pack it all back in. But we were there, and this opening was only open for 12 days. We were able to see and touch those stones. Some stories. Some stories. Listen to me. The Lord Jesus Christ is the bedrock of the stones that your faith and trust and life and future all rest on. Those hundred ton stones, I just finished saying what the four of them were. All those things rest on the great bedrock of Christ Jesus our Lord. The scripture goes on to talk about salvation there in verse 6, and it mentions that again in verse 7. And by the way, these two salvation words are different words in the Hebrew. I don't know if you knew that. In the English, it says salvation, salvation, but in the Hebrew, they're different. In verse 6, my salvation is Yeshua. And that word means deliverance. It means aid. It means victory. It means save. It means health and welfare. All those things are in that word, Yeshua, salvation. My victory, my salvation. Now, in verse 7, it's different. 
It's a different word. It's yesha. And yesha in the Hebrew means liberty. It means prosperity. It means saving. The name of Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. It means salvation. It means victory. In Christ is both liberty and victory, Yeshua. Christ is my salvation. Say it with me. Christ is my salvation. Christ is my victory. Come on. Christ is my victory. Absolutely. Christ is my Savior. Come on. Christ is my Savior. Absolutely. Number three, stronghold. Again, we're working through five things that are in this wonderful passage here. Stronghold. It's translated stronghold in both the New American Standard and the Jerusalem Bible. In the NIV, it's translated fortress. In the King James, it's defense. The Hebrew is Masada, M-E-T-S-A-D-A, Mat Sada. Mat Sada was a great fortress. It was the last stronghold of the Jews trying to hold out against the Roman legions. And if you go down to the Dead Sea, you can see from the Dead Sea above you is Masada, this great fortress, only accessible through a tiny little passageway where only one person could ever make its way up to this massive fortress high above the Dead Sea. And these Jews had found their way up to there. And the Romans conquered and conquered and conquered the Jews until finally this was the last stronghold. And 15,000 Romans, troops and auxiliary forces, came against 960 of these Jews, basically women and children and their families total of 960, and through a three-month siege, it might have been longer than that, but at least three months, they built a siege ramp so they could finally get up to the top of Masada, and it's a horrible story. I don't want to tell the whole thing, but they took the fortress, and the Jews died. We were there with our guides, Temperature got up to, I don't know, maybe 140, 145 or 50 in the sun. Dead sea, it's 1,200 feet below sea level, hottest place on earth. Anyway, and we were out in the sun as, as he told us about the commissioning service of the Israeli officers. He says, when the new officers are commissioned into the Israeli army, they bring them to Masada. And they say these words in unison together. Never shall Masada fall again. Now listen to me. The Lord Jesus Christ fell for you and I on Calvary. He gave up his life. But never Will that fortress, will that stronghold ever fall again? It will remain forever. And when he comes, he comes as the stronghold. He comes as the fortress. He comes to you and me as our defense. And again, I'm only talking to believers here. I'm only talking to the true church. But God has given us a great fortress and a great stronghold and a great defense in Christ. A defense from sin, a defense from the evil one, a defense from the world. Now, we can choose to run into the world and align with the world, or we can give up and give in to sin, or we can say in some way in our walk that really Satan is our leader, 
But as we take our stand in Christ, you listen to this? As we take our stand in him, he is the great stronghold fortress that will never fail, never fall, never end. Number four, glory. It says there in verse seven, on God, my glory rest. This wonderful word, glory, in the Hebrew is kabod. I'll spell it for you, K-A-B-O-W-D, kabod. And it means really two things. It means splendor and it means honor. He, he alone is our splendor. He alone is our honor. I was in a church one time, and one of the deacons of the church came up to me and said, I don't like your car. I don't like your watch. I don't like your suit. And I don't like your wife. And I turned to him and I said, you may not like all those things, but Christ is my glory. Christ is my honor. Christ is my splendor. Look, when you're ripped up, you remember, okay, who your splendor, who your glory, who your honor is. Who is it? Christ alone, say it with me, Christ alone, absolutely, very important. Christ is our honor. You know, it says in Hebrews 12, 2, he despised the shame. I love that scripture. He, Hebrews 12, 2, he despised the shame of the cross, right? He despised it. In other words, he wasn't going to get into it. When shame tries to put itself on you, Oh, there's nothing but trouble around you. Oh, there's nothing but issues around When shame looks to pull over top of you, you listen to this? Don't go there. Despise the shame. I'm not eating that. I'm not drinking that. I'm not going there. Christ despised the shame. Last one, and I'll end with this one, is refuge. It says this word refuge both in verse 7 and in verse 8. Refuge. Look, turn with me to Isaiah, if you will. There's a great scripture I'd like to read for us. Isaiah 25. You don't need to stand. I'll just read it for us. Isaiah 25, although I'm going to read five verses here. Isaiah 25, starting with verse 1, it says these wonderful words. It says, O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will give thanks to thy name. This is, of course, Isaiah speaking. For thou hast worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Thou hast made a city into a heap, a fortified city into a ruin. Boy, what a prophecy that is. A palace of strangers is a city no more. In other words, all these strongholds, all these things that would pull you down. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people, that's us, will glorify thee. Cities of ruthless nations will revere thee, for thou hast been a defense. There it is. For the helpless. A defense for the needy in his distress. And here's the next phrase. Oh, what a beautiful phrase. A refuge from the storm. A shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. Like heat and drought, thou dost subdue the uproar of the aliens. Like heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. There's so many wonderful scriptures about refuge. I mean, so many. I picked out just a few just so we can be hearing them and have them resound in our heart this morning. It says in Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is thy 
refuge. 2 Samuel 22.3 says, My high tower and my refuge. Psalm 57, verse 1. And Sandra, my wife, alluded to this already this morning. In the shadow of thy wings, I will take refuge. Jeremiah 16, 19. My refuge in the day of affliction. If you're going to write one reference down here, be sure to write down Hebrews 6, 18. Hebrews 6, 18. It says, we may have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. Fled for refuge. Say it with me. Fled for refuge. Don't flee into your own heart. You're trying to listen to me on this, right? Don't flee into your own despair, your own depression. Flee into the Lord. Doesn't mean you don't have things that are hitting you, but flee into him. He is our hope. He is our refuge. So where have we been this morning? We've talked about the rock. We've talked about my rock. Remember David ben Jesse's stone and what he said before he slung it. We've talked about the rock and the foundation of the bedrock of the western wall stones, that huge bedrock on which our faith and our hope, and the word, and our salvation are based. Secondly, we talked about salvation, and we said there were, he was both Yesha and Yeshua. He's both liberty and victory. Third, we've talked about glory, and what glory really was of splendor and honor and glory, and it's only in him. And finally, we talked about refuge, fleeing to Christ, our refuge. God bless you.